Math 1343, Week 10, Video 8, a complete ANOVA example. I'd like to do a whole problem in its entirety from beginning to end instead of spreading it out over a bunch of videos. So let's take a look at this example. A department chair is reviewing faculty members for evaluation purposes. He wonders if the mean grade, let me fix that real quick, he wonders if the mean grade in a class is the same for three particular faculty members. Probably should have proofed this before I started the video. Professor A, Professor B, and Professor C. After gathering final grades for some randomly selected students, he processes the data to get the following summary statistics. We'll look at the data here in a second, or the summary statistics. And the question is, can we conclude a 1% significance that the professors have equal mean grades? For Professor A, we took a sample of nine students whose mean grade was 75 with a standard deviation of 10.35. For Professor B, it was a sample of 10 students with a sample mean of 76, mean grade of 76 and a standard deviation of 13.67. And for Professor C, there were nine students with a sample mean of 81 for a grade with a, with a standard deviation of 8.33. And the grand values, if we look at all the students as one big sample, instead of separating them by professor, the grand sample size is 28, fairly evident from the sum of the sample sizes Grand sample mean is 77.28. Excuse me, I haven't had any caffeine today. And the grand sample standard deviation is 10.99. We're being asked to test at 1% if all the means are equal. All right, so we're gonna go through the, um, through this hypothesis test, ANOVA, using the critical value approach. Uh, it just occurred to me that in the previous video, I did not address the p-value approach. So I'm going to make an 11th video, or excuse me, a ninth video, make it a note here, to discuss how we would do both that, the previous problem and this one, using the p-value approach. All right, so before we even get started, the first thing we should do is analyze the situation to see if the F distribution is appropriate. And remember, there are two things we have to check, the samples and the variabilities. Let's start with the variabilities, namely the standard deviations. The criteria for the variabilities is that one of them cannot be more than twice another. And we do that by checking the lowest against the highest. So let's check the lowest standard deviation, 8.33 versus the highest, 13.67. And it's worth mentioning that when you make this, this uh, analysis, you do not consider the grand standard deviation. You only look at the standard deviations of the individual samples. Well, is 13.67 more than twice 8.33? Well, if you double 8.33, you get 16.66. 13.67 is not bigger than that. So our variabilities are reasonably close to each other in the sense that none of them is twice as large as another. So we're okay there. Now for the samples, we have a little bit more of a problem making ju a judgment call on that. Because one criteria for the samples is the sample size is at least 30 for each sample. Well, none of our sample sizes are 30. Even the grand sample size is 30. But in the absence of a large sample, we also have to check the data for any non-normal behavior, any skewedness or any uh, any outliers. Now, granted, the data is not here, but I did actually have some data. Now, before I show you the data, in a problem like this, you'll often be told, assume there are no non-normal samples, meaning that there's no problems. But just to convince you that we're okay, I'm going to share the, um, where am I going? I'm going to share data that I concocted. Here's the first professor's data. 60, 70, 70, 70, 75, 80, 80, 95. Those are pretty well spread out. Don't see any real outliers there, real problems. 
Same thing for Professor B, they're fairly spread out, no real outliers there, no big clusters at the beginning or at the end. And here, kind of the same thing, they're fairly spread out. Um, if there were issues with non-normal behavior in the samples, we would have to use uh, techniques that are beyond the scope of this course. So if you're ever asked to verify that the conditions are met, don't worry, they will be. Um, you'll just have to state the reason why. In this case, there's no non-normal behavior in our samples. All right, so let's go back to the, to the whiteboard for a second. Mm -hmm. All right, we're ready to hit the ground running. Let's, um, let's go through the motions. Step number one, state the hypotheses. Pretty straightforward. The null hypothesis is always of the flavor, all the means are equal. In this case, we could say uh, all three professors have the same mean rates. Meaning that their students have the same mean grades. The alternative would be at least two professors have different mean grades. All right, so not a whole lot to look at there. Second step is to determine the critical value of the regions. Keeping in mind that the F distribution in an ANOVA test is a right tail. And the significance level represents the area of the rejection region. In this case, I did give you a significance level of 1%. So we can say that this area is 1%, which is 0 0.01. But in order to use the F distribution, we need to know our degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom for the numerator is K minus one, where K is the number of categories, which is always the same as the number of populations or the number of samples. Well, in this problem, there were three samples, one for each professor, so K is equal to three. Since K is equal to three, that means that our degrees of freedom in the numerator, excuse me, come back here, means our degrees of freedom in the numerator is going to be three minus one, which is two, and the degrees of freedom in the denominator is n minus k, where n is the grand sample size and k is the number of categories. Our grand sample size was 28, I believe. That's right here. And we had three categories. We have 25 degrees of freedom. And now we've got all the parameters necessary to use our F table. We have the degrees of freedom in the numerator, the degrees of freedom in the denominator, and the area of the right tail or the significance level. So let's go open up the F distribution. Yeah, that's not where I wanted to go. I'm sharing the whole screen. We'll do that by opening the F distribution in the Canvas module in Canvas. All right, we're at 1% significance, so I'm gonna to need to go to the fourth page. Our degrees of freedom, uh, degrees of freedom in the numerator was two. It was three minus one is two. So we'll look in the second column, and our degrees of freedom in the denominator, I believe, was twenty-five. Go back and look at it real quick just to make sure. Yes, two degrees of freedom in the numerator, twenty-five degrees of freedom in the denominator. All right, two and twenty-five. Sure we're in the right significance level, we are, 1%. Second column, 25th row, and it looks like our critical value is 5.568 row. 5.568, I didn't really want that in red. 5.568. All right, so now we have the value that separates rejection from non-rejection. Third step is to calculate the test statistic, and this is where things can, are gonna slow down. Calculate the test statistic using an ANOVA table. All right, so let's get the ANOVA table started.
drawing lines. So whatever I draw. All right, so our ANOVA table, and we'll leave it with sources over here. Groups, errors, total. Let's start with our degrees of freedom, which we've actually already calculated on the previous page. Our degrees of freedom in the numerator were two and in the denominator were 25. For a total of 27 degrees of freedom. And really, we don't need that 27. That, um, that's just in case you know the total degrees of freedom and one of the other two and have to subtract to find the missing one. All right, now things are gonna to come to a slow crawl. We need to find our SSs, our SS group and our SS error. And we can find our SS total, but we really don't need it either. Um, but the SS total is one of the easier ones to calculate. We'll come back to this page in just a second. I wanna remind you what the formulas were. The formula for SSG, sum of squares for groups, was the sum of each sample size times deviation of each sample mean from the grand sample mean. That's not right. Actually, it's mathematically okay to put it there, but I'm making a big mess here. I need to shut up and concentrate. Writing, come on, draw. So the I um, sample mean minus the grand sample mean to see how far the sample mean deviates from whole mean squared. Our SS errors, there were a few ways to calculate it, a couple of ways, but one way was the sum of NI minus one times SI squared. So the individual sample sizes and standard deviations. And there were three ways to calculate SS total. Uh, but the shortest way was to do n minus one times s squared, which represent the, uh, the grand sample size and the grand standard deviation. So we need these two. Come back here. We need these two. But this guy is easy to calculate. So instead of doing two sums, let's do one sum, one calculation, and then subtract the results. This is why we have SS total. So we'll start with SS total. Our grand sample size was 28, so we'll do 28 minus one. Our grand standard deviation was 10.99. Naked squared. So get out the calculator of your choice. And put all that in there. And to, um, I'm gonna round it to two decimal places. 3,261.06. Let me press the buttons again and make sure I didn't make a mistake. Never a bad idea to do the calculation twice. Make an error, you probably won't realize it unless you have a reason to check it against something. But I got the same answer. All right, so let's go ahead and put that in our ANOVA table. 3,261.06. And now we have to choose which of the next two that we'll calculate. Um, well, we only have three samples, so the sum's gonna contain three parts. Uh, in general, I'm gonna calculate SSE only because the subtraction problem is easy to do and doesn't get square. So for SSE, for each sample, we have to take the sample size, subtract it one, and multiply it times the square of the standard deviation. Uh, the first sample size was nine, so nine minus one is eight. And we have to multiply that times the standard deviation of the first sample for Professor A. That was 10.35, where that, plus the standard, excuse me, the sample size for the second sample was 10, 10 minus one is nine. And the standard deviation for the second sample was 13.67. Make it squared. And for the third and final sample, its sample size was nine, so nine minus one is eight. And the standard deviation for the third sample was 8.33. Put all that in a calculator. <clears throat> eight times 10.35 squared plus nine times 
seven squared plus eight times eight point. Gotta start over. Eight times ten point thirty five squared plus nine times thirteen point fifty seven squared plus eight times eight point three three squared equals two decimal places three thousand ninety three point ninety one and that's our SSE three thousand ninety three point ninety one I believe is what it is. So to calculate the SSG We can take advantage of the fact that this column is additive, meaning that the top two values have to get the third one. So we can just subtract the two values that we currently have. 3,261.06 minus 3,093.91. And let's see what that equals. 3261.06 minus 3093.91 is a paltry 167. Point fifteen. Once we leave the SS column and move to the MS column, you don't need the third row anymore. But what you should remember is that the mean sum of squares, the MSs, are just SSs divided by their degrees of freedom. So for this one, we're going to divide 167.15 by 2. That won't divide evenly. But to two decimal places, we'll get 83.58. I actually got 83.575, but since I've already decided to round to two decimal places, here we are. And then for the other one, the MS errors, MSE, we need to do SS errors divided by its degrees of freedom. So 3,093.91 divided by 25. And again, that probably won't come out cleanly. Well, it's dividing by 25. It can't be that. I got four decimal places. I got 123 and we'll round two decimal places, 0.76. And then lastly, we calculate our F statistic. It takes a while to get through the table, especially when you have to calculate the SSs manually. Um, sometimes the SSs are given to you. So you start with this column populated. Uh, you start to calculate the degrees of freedom with that. Season. For our F statistic, Simply calculate the MSE value, 83.58, divided by the MS errors value, 123.76. So 83.58 divided by 123.76, decimal places is 0 0.68. All right, so again, that's where it kind of slows down depending upon how much information you're given. If you're given some SSs, it goes a lot quicker. You just calculate the MS column by dividing the SS by its degrees of freedom. And then the F is easy. You just take the top MS divided by the bottom MS. But we do have our critical value. Our critical value, draw, is F equals 0 0.68. And at this point, we're ready to make our decision. Step four, make a decision. In this case, we'll just say reject the null or do not reject the null. So let's see what we have to make our decision. Our critical value, which I'm about to highlight in yellow, is 0 0.68, pretty small critical value. Our, excuse me, our test statistic, let me say that again. Our test statistic is 0 0.68. Our critical value is 5.5680. It's pretty evident that the test statistic is less than critical value. So we'll say our test statistic is about here. 
f equals zero point, I wanna say eight six except, ex except 0 0.68. All right, so clearly that falls in the non-rejection region. So our, our, so our decision is to reject, do not reject an all hypothesis. So I'm just gonna say in parentheses, since the test is statistic lands in the non-rejection region, do not reject the null hypothesis. Again, the part in parentheses is what you think, but what you say is do not reject the null hypothesis. And the last thing, of course, is to answer the question. Go back and see what the question was. Can we conclude that the professors have equal mean grades? We cannot. Cannot conclude professors have these same mean grades. The means from the samples were different, but they were too different according to the variabilities of them. All right, so an ANOVA test is, again, just a hypothesis test, and it runs the same course, whether you do the critical value approach or p-value approach. Uh, the new aspect is uh, the F distribution and the linky steps for calculating test statistic, AKA the ANOVA table.